Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. This is another Author's Shelf episode uh, to remind you. The Author's Shelf is where we bring in uh, an author, and instead of talking to them about their own work, we ask them to pull something off of their shelf uh, and discuss it with them. It's a it's a way for us to get to know new books, new works, new authors, and well, well, new authors as well. This is a way for us to get to know uh, some of our favorite authors in a slightly different way than your standard interview format. Uh, all right. And today we are going to be talking about the fifth head of Cerberus. And why are we going to be talking about Gene Wolfe's second book? We're going to get there in just a moment. <laughs> uh, I am Craig Hanks, your host. And with me today, Brian Evanson. Brian, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Yeah, you know, not too bad. It's uh, excellent. It's early in the morning. Well, not early. It's mid morning on a Saturday, and I'm podcasting about Gene Wolfe. It could be a lot worse. You know, that's, I feel like that's true. Yeah, I'm living my best life, as the kids say. Brian, <laughs> <laughs> how about you? How are things going over there? Good. I'm fine. My my son just woke up a few minutes ago, and he's down playing video games, and he's promised to leave me alone. So we'll see if that actually happens. But yeah, uh, we're, we're good over here. Saturdays as a kid. Yes. All the video games you can handle. Mm. <laughs> so, Brian, you are the author of a, a whole lot of stuff um, <laughs> that has won a whole lot of awards. Uh, but uh, of your works, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you would point people toward uh, if they want to check out your stuff? And then we're going to get to Gene Wolfe here in just a moment. Sounds good. Um, well, so I'd probably point people, the, the book that's won the most awards is a book called The Song, Song for the Unraveling of the World. Uh, which won the World Fantasy Award and the Shirley Jackson Award and was a finalist for the Ray Bradbury Award. And it's a book of stories um, that uh, are kind of horror uh, for the most part, but also kind of make forays into science fiction, make forays into kind of more literary fiction. And so it's about kind of the lines between different genres. And, uh, you know, a lot, lot of very short stories. I see myself as more of a story writer than a um, novelist, even though I've done both things. Uh, in terms of novels, I'd point people to, um, there's a book called Last Days, which is about um, a detective who um, stumbles into a um, cult situation um, with, in which uh, he is uh, very quickly in over his head. Hmm. And Brian, you are also, I, I noticed with uh, some a happiness in my heart, a translator. Yes. And it looks like you've done a lot of French translation. So yeah, yeah. you and I have got a lot to, we've got a lot to talk about. Cool. I, uh, I'm a French speaker myself and uh, wish, wish that I had that skill set. That mm. sounds like a lot of fun. Um, all right. So uh, let's see, what else was I going to say? You, you are out in Los Angeles. You teach at Cal arts. Is that still the case? That, that's still the case. Yeah. I like yeah, it. How long have you been out there? I've been here about uh, six or seven years, I guess now at this point. So, okay. and before that, I was in Rhode Island for a long time. Before that, I was in, I've kind of been all over the place, but I grew up in Utah and have lived everywhere after that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Rhode Island to California, it's like literally opposites. I, I'm not sure. It was just about as far as you can go. If I'd lived in Maine, <laughs> it would be you know a little farther. But yeah, it was definitely a big change, and but a really positive change. Uh, we really like Los Angeles. Uh, you know, that's a common refrain from a lot of people I, I know that have gone there. Uh, all right. Well, let's we, we've got your books and I'll link to some of your stuff. Uh, at the very least, I'll link to your website in the show notes so people can go check that out. Um, the stuff that you have written. Uh, but today we're going to talk about something that you contributed to, I guess, maybe would be a way to say it. And that's this one, The Fifth Head of Cerberus, the second book by Gene Wolfe. Um, and this one is, this is a new edition with a new introduction by one Brian Evanson. That's right. Um, so mm -hmm. there is a, there's an introduction here that's uh, several pages and, uh, pr well, obviously precedes the book, but in it you say, yeah, maybe you read the book first and then come back to this, right? That's right. Um, so this is this is the book that we're talking about today. And it's for obvious reasons. You know, sometimes we ask an author to pull something off their shelf and, uh, you know, it's something that they loved as a kid or whatever. But this is something that you actually got to write the introduction for. Yeah. Why did you do it? Um, 
how did that come about? Why Gene Wolfe? All this stuff. Yeah, give right, us a right, little background right. on uh, your yeah. your involvement with this book. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it was a book that was incredibly uh, important to me as a, as a young writer. Um, and so, um, and I've, I've talked about it over the years, you know, at various, you know, interviews and podcasts and things like that. And so uh, when they decided to reissue um, uh, Fifth Head in the Tours Essential series, um, one of the editors there maybe an assistant editor had, had heard me talking about it. And so wrote out, wrote to me and asked if I'd be interested in doing, um, originally it was going to be an afterward. Um, they had another writer who was going to do the uh, introduction and that writer who I won't tell you who it is exactly since they had to back out at the last mm -hmm. minute had some personal stuff come up and, and couldn't do it. Uh, and so I went from thinking I was going to do an afterward to writing a, a, an introduction to the book. Um, and yeah, I was, I really was delighted to be asked to, to, to do it partly because, um, I think it's a, a fairly complex book. Um, I think it's something that for me kind of, um, is on this line between what we think of as genre fiction and literary fiction. And, and in that sense, it creates this kind of bridge, uh, uh between genre fiction and literary fiction, which is something that I, I think we need more of. Mm -hmm. um, that, that I, I think that, that there's many more connections than people sometimes like to think. Um, and, you know, the funny thing, too, is I think a lot of genre readers get that already. I know so many genre readers who read literary fiction and genre fiction and just enjoy both of them. But there yeah. are there's a kind of group of, of people who think of themselves as literary readers um, who only read literary fiction. And, and uh, you know, uh, so so they're in some ways the, the, the people who need the bridge. Um, so yeah, I got asked to do the introduction, um, was really excited to just have the chance to do it. Um, Wolf had been really important to me, um, uh, when I was younger, um, another kind of series of his called the book of the new sun was, was one of my first forays into science fiction in a way that really changed my, the way I, I thought about writing and, uh, um, and, uh, and yeah, it was just a pleasure to, to go back and reread, uh, the book again as well. Yeah, yeah. The Book of the New Sun is one that uh, we have been bugged about on more than one occasion that we need to cover on the podcast. So, uh, yeah, this is this is uh, not the first mention that we've had of it. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's it's quite a bit longer. It's you know it's a four volume series. Um, right. But but even just I I'd suggest just start with the first volume of that. And see what you think. Before we get into the the text the book itself i do want to ask you a little bit about something you just said this kind of bridge between genre fiction and literary fiction and longtime listeners of the show are probably already you know champing at the bit waiting for me to give my spiel about um I, my, I i have a certain amount of dislike for the uh the split between yeah. these two yeah. uh, it's my my whole thing is hey if it's if it's good it's good Right. And if it's not, it's not, uh, you know, but there does tend to be this, this idea that, oh, well, if it's literary fiction, that means it's good. <laughs> if right, it's not, right. you know, if it's genre fiction, yeah. it's just populist kind of, you know, right, uh, right. stuff for the masses. Yeah. Um, how, what do you mean when you say a bridge between the two? Um, is it just be because it is something that's more, okay, we'll use the word literary, um, but set in a sci-fi world? Is you know, that I, the bridge, I, or is there more to it than that? I, I think there's more to it than that. I think it's partly that um, that there's things about the Wolf Book that if someone if someone comes to it who only knows kind of literary fiction, um, they'll be able to pick up on and enjoy, and it'll mm. give them away. And so, I, I, in a way, it's like a gateway drug um, to genre fiction. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I think that yeah, for it, it's so funny the way I, I totally agree with you about genre fiction and literary fiction and the divide. I don't think there should be a divide there at all. And for, for years, there was no divide. Uh, early 20th century books, um, mm -hmm. you would you would publish these um, what uh, kind of collections of stories um, by a single author, but it'd be a mix of things. There'd be, you know, a literary story, a horror story, a science fiction story. And, and the idea is that you'd, you'd have these, the, a miscellany and these things could all kind of live by one another and kind of talk to one another. And then I think what happened was that um, uh, disciplines developed in universities. And, and when that happened, um, you know, I, I think the tendency was to start to kind of split things up and divide things and put them in categories. And, and I think that started innocently enough, but, but 
it very quickly started to be a valorization. So good or mm. bad, depending on what category it was in. And and I, I also agree. I mean, I, I think um, there are there are good uh, works on both kind of the literary side and the genre side of of whatever line is there. Uh, and there's also bad books on both sides. And for me, I'm, I'm so much more interested in, in just the, the the good work on both sides. I also think it's it's like um, you know the, the the people that I went to graduate school who taught me, um, which has been a few years. Um, I think they were really trained to just like see that kind of like divide between pop culture and 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 uh, high culture as very distinct. And I think well, yeah, for, yeah, that's yeah, that's not new. No, that's definitely not new. But I, th- but I think for, for a lot of people um, nowadays, it's like, you know, you, we, we watch all sorts of things on TV. You know, you can, you, you, you watch a Disney movie one night, you watch a kind of like art film another night and so on and so forth. And so, so I think just the way we're kind of composed mentally now um, is against that sense of division um, more than, than, than it used to be. That's really interesting. I, I haven't thought about that. Are we, um, you know, for, for good or ill, are we losing that sense of division? I would say mostly for good, but you yeah. know, there, there is something to the idea of specialization. Yeah. Um, although yeah. it is interesting to hear, you know, or to be reminded of, uh, kind of that earlier way of doing things where a writer was a writer was a writer mm-hmm. and, you know, could write, uh, across a lot of different genres. And yeah. I, I don't hear that as often now, you know, it, no. somebody is a, a sci-fi writer or, you know, they're a magical realist writer or right, uh, you right. know, whatever the case may be, but yeah. it, it feels a little more specialized now. I, I think it is more uh, specialized on now. the writer it's, side. Yeah. I think that's partly a marketing thing. You know, it's, it's, uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's much easier to know where to put the book in a bookstore. If it's like all, all stories of the same kind, it's much easier to know how to review yeah. it. And so, and that's one of the funny things with my own fiction. So like something like song for the unraveling of the world, it's like, there's a variety of different stories that are kind of there and there's something tonally uh, similar about them. There's all sorts of connections and thematic connections, but, but, um, you know, it, it is hard to know what to, where, where to put that in the bookstore or, you know, it's funny sometimes for me to watch readers um, and, and uh, reviewers try to talk about it and try to think about, all right, why are these stories together? What do I call this book? What's the name of it? And usually they kind of gravitate towards calling it literary horror, uh, which allows them to, you know, say, well, it's literature and it's horror, but then there's all sorts of other genre things going on there as well that just kind of get pushed down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, uh, let's get into the fifth head of Cerberus. Now, yes. um, what I want to do is put off as long as possible, maybe the entire discussion. I want to put off for as long as possible any spoilers. I, it's maybe the wrong word to use mm-hmm. with a, a story like this. But, you know, there are elements to the story that if you even know this basic fact, uh, this is why I didn't do a recap, by the way. Uh, right, right. Uh, but if you know this basic fact, um, you're you're not gonna <laughs> go on the ride the way that Gene Wolfe intended, shall right, we right. say? Yeah. Uh, but I but uh, but I do want to talk about the book, you know, maybe from a thirty thousand foot view for a little while, um, and then you know we can get into a few specifics here and there. But uh, for anybody who hasn't read the book, keep listening. Um, you know, let this hook you in if you haven't read it. Uh, and if you have, then, you know, then you can get upset at us for not getting more specific <laughs> more quickly. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but you say in your uh, introduction that is actually an afterword that works as both, <laughs> you say that the book mimes being a novel. It acts like a novel. Yeah. Uh, it, but the implication there being it's not quite a novel. Can you no. explain to us what the fifth head of Cerberus is and, and how it mimes being? A yes, novel? I'll try to do it and I'll try to do it without spoilers. Um, <laughs> so, so it, it, it essentially it's, you can see it as a novel um, in that it's like a, a novel made of three different novellas. Uh, but those novellas are also distinct at the same time. So, so there's not, the, the, the connections between them are a little bit oblique. Um, you can definitely see where the connections are, but it's like, it's not like one picks up where the other left off. Um, and, and, you know, originally when, when Wolf published it, he published, um, uh, the first novella kind of as its own thing. And it, it definitely can, can live and function as its own thing. Uh, it's, and I think it's a, a, a kind of wonderful, kind of brilliant piece of work. Um, and some, some, sometimes what I suggest to people, 
uh, is to just read the first novella, see how they feel about it, and then kind of go back and read everything and then reread the first novella because I think it changes uh, as you read uh, the other novellas. Um, so so there, there's this sense that, you know, there's something that's kind of complete that begins it. And then there's something um, that complicates it. The second novel kind of complicates what you thought you knew about the first novel. There are moments where it makes the reality of the first piece a little more unstable. Um, there's a kind of unreliability that starts to creep in. Uh, and, and also, I mean, it puts you in a position where you're not sure to what degree the second novel is meant to be uh, a story, a fictionalization um, within um, the world of the of the piece, and to what degree it's meant to be a kind of um, uh, something that describes uh, something that's hidden about the world itself. Yeah. Uh, and then, the, then you, from there, you go to the third novella, <laughs> and uh, it ends up being this kind of collection of documents that someone is going through. And again, I'm not going to say too much because I don't want to reveal too much. But but again, it's it's we have partial documents. Uh, uh, we're, we're kind of sorting through them, trying to make sense of them. And, and again, they, they seem to be commenting both on the, uh, on the second novella and on the first novella in their own way. Uh, and, and also they're partial, you know, they're, they're things that you just don't have. And so you're, you're having bits and pieces and you, you're kind of completing the puzzle based on that. Well, and so, and there, there's even missing stuff in that right. third one, um, that, yes. that you mentioned in, in your intro that, uh, you know, the, the narrator, the, the character, from yeah. whatever, he picks up something and then decides not to read it so he discards it so we don't get to read it and right 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 yeah so yeah it, yeah it feels so, like so that <laughs> uh, sorry go on go on oh no i mean that's it it's like the the, the the whoever is going through those documents um is 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 both doing a good job and not at the same time and so you get a sense there are things that he just doesn't want to deal with or that he doesn't you know he's he's done with his job he has other things he wants to do um so so wolf is very deliberately saying there's pieces of this you don't have yeah. Um, yeah. It, it feels like that uh, kind of unreliability is a major, uh, it's a major cross thread. It's a theme yes. between all three, right? And yeah. do you, is that something that you particularly enjoy? The unreliability, the, the idea of having to kind of go through the maze of the characters' heads to try yeah. to figure out what what's real and what's not? Or it, it, does that frustrate you at all? Uh, or do you just uh, just straight no, up love it? I, I, I'm really I, I'm really comfortable with with uncertainty for for some reason. Maybe my my father's a physicist, and I think maybe he, I you know we were raised mm -hmm. to think that things were uncertain. The world was uncertain in various ways, um, and so so I like that. I, I kind of find it exhilarating um, to have these the, these moments where the ground beneath your feet kind of starts to feel a little bit unstable. Um, and, but I could see how it, you know, potentially it can be frustrating for some readers. And there, 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 there are two kind of larger types of wolf readers that at least I've seen. And one is the, the reader who is, is like me, very comfortable with the uncertainty and, and, you know, f can see the structure and kind of can figure out how things hold together, but, but barely sees things, you know, doesn't need all the answers to things, but really enjoys, um, the, the sense of something, um, uh, somewhat mysterious still being there. So it's a little like having like a rope bridge or something that you're crossing uh, where it's, it's, it's swaying and it's uncertain, and, but it's also like you can get from one side to the other. It is going to um, get you there. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then there are other um, very smart readers of Wolf who um, love to explicate him. Um, so they go through <laughs> all the references, all the kind of details. There's three or four podcasts that are related to Wolf. Um, there's there's uh, a number of, of commentators who are just really excellent in terms of the way they go through it. And and to me, they, they feel like people who um, are more interested in rereading Wolf than reading Wolf, um, because there's something about that kind of initial experience of like, um, not knowing quite what's going on and, and figuring out that you have enough handholds to kind of get through it. That really, for me, is the most satisfying part of it. it was, so what, what does that mean? Somebody is more interested in rereading than reading. Uh, expound on that a little bit for me. What do you mean? Well, so I think when you, when you read a book initially, there's something about the kind of initial apprehension of a book where you are um, going through an experience with something that you don't know. 
Um, and, and, you know, it's very much like kind of the early stages of a relationship where you meet someone and everything is new and exciting and there's lots of surprises, some good, some bad. Um, and, and, and that ends up, you know, being very much, um, part of the experience is, is this, this kind of, um, moments of surprise, moments of, 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 of joy and uncertainty, um, that, that are all there. Um, as opposed to, I think when you're rereading something, it's like you have a familiarity with it and, and, and there's something comfortable about returning to it and, and you're, you're learning kind of different levels of it. So yeah. it's like, and, and, and I think that idea is, is a lot of the readers who are, um, you know, who are interested in explicating Wolf, um, uh, really are like, all right, um, this trying to figure out these references, you know, there's, there's this, there's a moment kind of early in the first novella. This is not really a, a spoiler where they're in a library and, and there's a, a things mentioned about a bookshelf and, and, uh, um, readers have gone through and said, all right, this is exactly what's there. This is what I think is happening there. And, yeah. and it is like, there, there are these little, um, games that, that Wolf plays where if you want to kind of go and you look for these little details, you can, you can, you can find them. And, and there's a certain satisfaction with that, but that seems less to me like reading and more like, you know, filling hunting. in the gaps, hunting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's, yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I like that. That's this, it's something that, um, you know, listeners, many, many of our listeners are big Brandon Sanderson fans. Right. Um, and, uh, it, you know, so it, obviously a different style of writer, shall we say, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, similarly, there are those who just love going along for the ride and those who, uh, what they, they call them, I think they call them Cosmere knots who dive mm. in and they want every detail and they right. want to connect every dot and, and right. submit to the, the online forums and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so and I'm just putting just this a, in yeah. author terms. I can understand. Right, right, right. Well, I, it may <laughs> just be to a, a personality difference. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. it's like the degree to which you have to have control over the text and the degree to which you can kind of enjoy it without that. So, but it's, yeah. it's not, you know, I, I've reread fifth headed servers a bunch of times and I do notice different things about it every time. But but I've never done the thing of going through and reading a paragraph and thinking about all right what's everything in this paragraph and where where's the the uh, the puzzles and the tricks right. and the games. So, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you and I share a similarity there in our mm. style of reading. Right. Um, now, after you read this book, I don't know, maybe a number of times, you decided to try it yourself. This uh, three part. Yeah. The, the three novellas as one novel. Right, right. Um, and I, you talked a little bit about this in your intro, but I did want to ask you about it. If, you know, if there are any other details that you want to share how that went, because I thought it was interesting to, to think about, um, you know, seeing something that we love and trying mm. to, if not mimic it or mirror it, then at least take some inspiration from it. Yeah. And I'm curious how the process went for you and, and what the difficulties are in trying to craft a narrative from three very distinct separate parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I, I'd read uh, Fifth Head Observerus and and had this experience of, of, you know, reading the first novella and then feeling like the second novel, uh, novella um, kind of revised or changed it or shifted it in some way. And then reading the third and feeling like the shift was still going on. And this was kind of when I was first uh, trying to write uh, a, a longer novel. I've written a lot of stories, but but uh, I was working on a, a longer novel and I thought, oh, I'll just do that. I'll, I, I'd done novellas. And I thought, oh, all I have to do is write one novella, and then I'll write another novella that kind of um, um, contradicts it or deletes it or changes it in some way. And then I'll write a third novella that just makes it so everything, you know, resolves and, and you know, it's complicated and just look yet a third way. Um, and so I, you know, I, I wrote the first novella. This is actually, it's a book called The Open Curtain, which is set in, in, in Utah. It's about a young Mormon kid who... Uh, uh, gets involved in things that are uh, kind of uh, over his head. Um, but uh, so I wrote the first novella. Um, it came out well. I was happy with it, happy where it went to. Um, I wrote the second novella, which was a little harder because you realize that, you know, um, you, you're, you're, you're kind of figuring out how you kind of are taking the thing apart that you've written before um, in a way that still doesn't like destroy it or, or make it feel like you shouldn't have read it. Um, and then I got to the third novella and I realized, oh, you, you have to, I'm going to have to write something that um, both works on its own as a novella and also kind of closes out the whole thing. Um, and uh, 
it took me forever to do that. It took me about six years um, to, to, to do it. I, I wrote um, close to a thousand pages, I think, of trying things and, and finally kind of came up with something that um, was um, almost out of frustration that just suddenly made everything click for me. So, so what I found was it's much harder to kind of compose something of like three distinct sections or parts um, than, than, than I thought. So, so Wolf was an inspiration, but I, I, you know, as I was trying to write this book for myself, I realized more and more, um, you know, what a, what a, um, a challenge it is, uh, especially if you want to do it as well as you can. Yeah, I, um, I've never attempted to write like any of my favorite authors, uh, but I, I do write music. And yeah. it's, uh, it's incredibly frustrating to find somebody who inspires you to try, you know, this new thing. Uh, and then you try it and you realize, oh, man, turns yeah. out they're really, really good. And right, I, right. <laughs> I'm going to need to practice a lot more before right. I can do what they're doing. Right, right. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's all right. Well, so and I, I think what happened was I, I, I'm very happy with the way that book came out. It was a finalist for an Edgar Award, The Open Curtain. Um, but, but the, the, the novels I've written since then, I've, I've figured out other ways to, to, to approach them and do them. So I, I realized that it was, you know, it may have seemed that, uh, an easy way to write a no novel is just throwing three novellas together. But, but in fact, that's probably the hardest, you know, one of the hardest ways to write a novel. I can only imagine. Um, speaking of writing, um, you write in the, uh, in the intro that all three novellas focus on the importance of writing as a way of processing the world. Um, what, is, what do you mean by that? Is it just about the, the points of view that we're dealing with, the way that he structured it? What, what does it mean to use writing as a way to, to process the world? And what is he doing here with that? Yeah, I mean, it's partly about the points of view. I mean, uh, it's partly that the characters are, are engaged in write, written narratives as well. I mean, they're, they're, it's not only that the book is narrated by someone, but there's there's very much an act of, of recording that goes on in, in um, several of the novellas. And then also there's this, you know, in the final one, you have this these documents and materials, um, uh, and someone is literally trying to make a decision about some uh, someone else based on these documents. And for me, that's very much about the way in which the world itself ends up being something that... Um, uh, we process through language, um, something that we kind of make decisions on based on language as well. So, so it's those sorts of things. Um, the, the second novella, um, is called, um, a story is its subtitle. Um, it's a, a story or its title is a story, a story in quotes by John V. Marsh. Um, and so there's a sense that it's a story. Um, and, and, and I think as you read that, you start to think about what that means in relation to this. And you start to, to wonder the degree to which, you know, how far the storiness of it or the kind of fictionalization of it mm. is there. Um, so, and, and then the first one is someone who is recording his own experiences. But as you continue to read along with it, you start to realize that there are, um, there may be reasons that he is recording them in this particular way that he is not revealing to you. Yeah. Which you, when you're reading fiction, you're, you're reading a, a fictional autobiography or you know, of sorts in this right. first novella. Um, and I think it, it sometimes it's tempting as a, a reader of fiction, knowing that the author has had full control over, you know, what you know and what you don't and all, all of that. It's frustrating to think, Oh man, why didn't this character just, you know, be reliable? Why can't I just trust everything that's uh, on the page? And yeah. then you step back and realize, okay, well, hang on. If I read a non-fictional autobiography, yeah. I have to do the exact same thing. You can't just read, uh, you know, it, it, like politicians would be the worst examples <laughs> of this, but you can take, you know, actors and musicians and anybody yeah, who writes absolutely. an autobiography um, you have to stop and think, Oof, you know, how much do yeah. I trust their right, narrative right, of right. these events? Yeah. I mean, uh, and even, even if it's, even if it's, you know, they're fairly objective and, and trustworthy, it's like, there's also an active selection that's going on. You know, they're making decisions mm -hmm. about what you get to read, what's important. Um, uh, that, that, you know, so, so there is a kind of basic unreliability that's, that's, um, uh, uh, you know, they're in any any kind of biographical or autobiographical narrative, and it's just a question to what degree it's it's forefronted, and to what degree it's something that's kind of beneath the surface. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there are a couple of other things that are recurring themes in this book, and I thought maybe we'd talk about that just a little bit. Sure. Um, one of them is uh, is the, the the recurring theme of uh, colonialism. Yes. Um, and there's it, it it it's complex enough just in the first novella. I <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I haven't I haven't read the second and third ones yet, but uh, mm. but I'm getting there, and I'm sure it will get even more complex. Yeah. Um, but one of them is the idea of uh, human nature isn't quite the right way to put it. What, what does it mean to be human? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's a recurring theme. And there's a uh, passage I wanted to read on page 48. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Okay, here we go. Uh, there's a, there's a character, Mr. Million, um, mm-hmm. who is a, a facsimile of a human mind. He's a, a, yes. a preserved kind of AI yeah, yeah, type yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah. they, they they call him Mr. Million. Well, it's a, there's a whole joke in there, but the idea being that uh, a a mind or a brain to whatever degree possible has been uploaded into this computer. Right. Um, and, and so now he can live forever as a machine. Uh, how mm-hmm. exciting. Um, and the character, or sorry, our, our main character here writes, although I loved Mr. Million as much as I had when I was a boy, I was never able after a certain conversation in which I learned the meaning of the familiar lettering on his side quite to reestablish the old relationship now that he knows what this uh, mm. what this uh, person is uh, it's hard for right. him to feel the same way he did before i was always conscious as i am conscious now that the personality i loved had perished years before i was born and that i addressed an imitation of it fundamentally mathematical in nature responding as that personality might to the stimuli of human speech and action and this this passage really caught my eye as mm-hmm. um getting getting into maybe maybe this is our surface level getting into what right these issues are of what it means to be human mm-hmm. because it, there is this idea there's this uh there's this hope this wish that the human mind uh is mathematical and therefore comprehensible in some way mm-hmm. um but it, it, is that i don't know how do you, how do you feel about this idea this concept it, are are we more than just math or mm-hmm. is it just you know, uh, right. is it just physics? Uh, yeah, whatever type of Newtonian <laughs> physics ruling our, our brains. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I mean, and of course, this kind of goes back. There's so many writers now who, um, you know, ranging from Ted Chang to 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 Greg Egan to all sorts of other people who talk about, um, you know, uploading um, consciousness and the degree to which consciousness could kind of be replicated. Um, and and you know, I. I I think there's an assumption there that brains work in the same way. And, and I'm not totally sure that's the case. I, I, I wonder if brains, the connections, the neural connections that brains form may be unique from, from brain to brain. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, um, you know, and, and basically the structure is the same, but the brain is allowed to develop in its own way. I mean, we have a certain amount of evidence that there's, you know, a certain amount of plasticity in the brain that, that people in, in, you know, similar situations can, can think in different ways. Um, but but may, maybe you can do that. I, I, it's a really interesting idea to think about kind of uploading consciousness. Um, but also, I think the idea that, that Wolf raises in that passage is a really interesting one. You know, even if you can uh, upload consciousness, there's going to be a moment when you realize that what you're talking to is not something that's, um, you know, that, that that's a, a simulacra or that's an imitation in some ways. And how does that change your sense of things? Um, and, you know, that's a really kind of critical uh, question for us just at this particular moment with AI as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the number of interactions that we have with <laughs> uh, AI when we're, we're kind of, you know, trying to get our phone bill changed or things like that. It's, it's, uh, um, and, and the moments when you're, you're not sure where the AI stops or starts, I think mm-hmm. it's, it's really intriguing. So. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating and troubling question. Yes. Um, it, and and whenever it comes up, I always think to myself, you know, I I, I kind of game out. What would mm-hmm. I do? Yeah. Um, and you know, if somebody said we can take your your brain, and this is uh, this is how Wolf describes it in the book, you, we can yeah. take your brain and essentially uh, digitize layers of it as we shave mm-hmm. it off. You know, kind mm-hmm. of uh, they they literally take it apart and digitize it. Uh, and so you can upload yourself um, and live forever as a machine, 
Right. But it, this, your, your, your brain will die. Your body will die. Right. Right. right? And right. so that's the cost of it. And as I think about that, my immediate gut instinct is to say, no way. Yeah. <laughs> because no matter, no matter what this new entity is, I'm yeah. gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so it's, uh, it's just a way for me to kind of answer, do I feel like I'm simply mathematical in nature? Apparently right. not. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like there's something intrinsically that is me that is, well, that it's is not so, a machine. Yeah, and I've had this conversation with other people before who are, are don't see any problem with it, which is weird to me that you don't see any um, issue with it. Um, I think it's partly, you know, I was raised in a culture that, that um, has this, they, they see the soul as the combination of the body and the spirit. And so if you see that kind of connection as, as essential, it's really hard to kind of get on board with the idea of like um, being reduced to being digital in some ways. Right. Jettisoning so, the body. Yeah, exactly. So, so, oh. so I, yeah, so maybe, I don't know, but, but I, I have like, there, there are people who are like, oh, well, you, you're just being essentialist about this. It's like, you know, there's no reason, you know, to, to think it's not you, it's still you. Um, but it still feels like a copy to me. So I don't know. It, it raises questions that are interesting. Yeah. And of course, Wolf, yeah, he raises these questions and then also raises them in regard to uh, um, um, humans uh, and, and people who may not be human as well. Oh, man. OK, now we get into <laughs> some of the uh, the issues around colonialism that he brings up. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you mentioned in your intro that he, he has a nuanced uh, or, or yeah. subtle take on yeah, yeah. colonialism. I. I just reading again, I've only read the first of the three novellas, but just reading that one doesn't feel all that, uh, uh, well, nuanced isn't the right word. It's not all that subtle. He, he's not mm. a huge fan. No, um, no, no, he's not he, a huge fan of colonialism, but he, he's also <laughs> not, he doesn't do the thing where he, he lets you, um, he doesn't tell you straight out colonialism is wrong. Mm. Um, it's, I mean, I think he, he tells you in other ways. And, you know, one of the great things in the book is that he presents arguments and then flips them on their head. He shows characters doing that. And then you can see that in the kind of structure of the book itself as well, where you have a kind of first novella and then it kind of gets flipped on its head with the later ones. Yeah. It, but uh, yeah, the, the concept, the way, the way that he ties the two together is by, uh, introducing the concept that, uh, uh, almost almost by necessity colonialism creates an uh, an other that yeah. then gets reduced uh, in their yeah. humanity i i, I don't know I, I think historically that's uh accurate uh, mm-hmm. theoretically maybe it's not necessarily true but uh, right. Right, right. Uh, anyway yeah it's a lot of fascinating questions to dig into yeah um, no, for sh- for sure yeah and and you're right. I mean, it's it's his his he's not a fan of colonialism. So in that sense, it's not subtle at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say uh, wrap up by talking a little bit about his specific style. And I've purposely saved this for last uh, mm. because I wanted the Gene Wolfe fans out there to really be just screaming at their car stereos uh, to talk about <laughs> style. This whole mm-hmm. conversation, I, you know, okay. I wanted them to get really frustrated and then you know, provide that relief. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. <laughs> so, right. let's talk about his style. How? How? Hey, first of all, can you? And if you can, how do you define yeah. Gene Wolfe's style for somebody who's never read him before? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, part of it is um, I I find his style. Um, deceptively straightforward I, I think i would say um but it's but the, there's there's weirdnesses to it kind of all the way through it and and there are these moments where the characters especially the the narrators um um say things that only later do you begin to understand them so there's this this sense um as you're reading wolf that um that the little things that you kind of pass over uh and don't know what to do with are going to circle back in some way later yeah. Um, but he's also very playful. It's like the, the, the start of, um, of, of the fifth head of Cerberus. It starts when I was a boy, my brother David and I had to go to bed early, whether we were sleepy or not. And that's playing with, um, uh, the beginning of Proust's, uh, Alla Recherche, uh, 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 in search of lost time, um, where, um, you know, it starts with a very similar, um, sentence and, and w- but it's about, you know, someone having to go to bed early. Um, and so there's a kind of game that's being played there. 
um, which uh, if you if you know um, these kinds of little elusive moments, then, then you get a certain amount of pleasure out of that. If you don't, this the style itself is, is still good and it carries you forward. Um, it's also a style that I feel um, is relative. He, he, you don't feel as you do with some 19th century authors, um, the, the presence of Wolf himself. It, it, you feel like he's letting, um, uh, you know, he, he takes a lot of joy in letting the characters kind of express themselves and think of their own way. But yeah. You know, on that note, actually, there's um, a passage that jumped out to me that, uh, that made, made me think of essentially that very thought that he, has given his character a distinct enough voice that um, mm-hmm. that I just I just buy in. I, I believe that yeah. uh, that I'm in that character's head, uh, which obviously, as you say earlier, creates problems when you realize how unreliable this all is right. and whatnot. Right, right. But uh, I, <laughs> and this is this will feel like a nonsensical thing to bring up, but it's you know, hey, we we all latch onto certain things as we read, right? But uh, there, so this is early on in the story, page twenty. Um, and what's happening here doesn't really matter all that much. But I'm going to read a single sentence. And right. pe- people are going to want me to stop by the time I'm done because it gets weird. <laughs> but he says, I remember one patron, a heavy, square-faced, stupid-looking man who seemed to be someone of importance, who was so eager to enjoy the company of his protege, who did not want to go inside until the display was over, that since he insisted on privacy, 20 or 30 bushes and small trees had to be rearranged on the parterre to make a little grove around them. That was one sentence. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, my instinct as uh, as an editor is to grab my blue pencil and be like, okay, this is this mm-hmm. is super complex. I'm so confused. Um, and then I stop and think to myself, no, this is this is stream of consciousness. This is actually how someone thinks mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. how their mind wanders as they're as they're trying to deal with one subject, their mind wanders over to another one. And oh, by the way, here's this little aside. And then, okay, that's right. I was talking about this. I'll bring it back. Right. And so my instinct as an editor is to go blue pencil. Right, on it. Right, right. Um, but then I stop and think, no, this is, it, it's, and, and it's very wolf to kind yeah, of yeah, be absolutely. able to do that stream of consciousness yeah. and make it all tie together. Right. Well, and the other thing with a sentence like that, it's like, he's, he's, um, um, using he's he's talking about the way in which this kind of barrier and privacy was constructed, and he's doing it in a sentence that's somewhat convoluted, and and that kind of reflects the way in which, um, you know, the action was was kind of being you know how how the how the barrier was being constructed at the same time. So there is a, there is a kind of weird sense of hiding that goes on in that sentence itself. The convolutions itself kind of reflects on the content, um, which I like. Layers upon layers, Brian. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing I'd say is, is, so it's very hard for me to talk about his style because I feel like it shifts from from um, novella to novella in this. Yeah. And and he's he's a very capable stylist. I, I think he, um, you know, if I see, you know, most characteristic of his style, I think is 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 the desire to kind of um, uh, make reality feel contingent. And then also uh, uh, uses of, of different sorts of unreliability with with uh, with his narrators as well. Yeah. Well, it, let's uh, let's think about wrapping this up. Are there any other points that you want to bring up? Um, it just just uh, off the top of your head, things that you love to talk about or or you know clue people into before they read a book like this. Anything else that you want to talk about before we hit yeah. the, the end button? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, with, with something like this going into the fifth head of Cerberus, it's best to, I I feel like it's best to read it, um, without worrying too much about, um, you know, uh, understanding everything or following everything or figuring out all the puzzles. I think it's better to just kind of dive in and experience it. And in that sense, I mean, it can feel a little bit like the thing that, um, I used to love when I was a kid of, of reading a book that feels like a, just a little bit too hard for you. Um, <laughs> and it, it's not really, I, I think that you can have a, a, an excellent experience um, with it um, on a first read. Um, and I think in some ways your best experience is going to be your first read. Um, but it's also like, it's a book that if, if you've read a book like that, when you were a kid, my parents were big readers and they were always pushing me to read books that were just a little beyond me. Um, then, then you almost feel like you've dreamed the book more than read it in mm. some ways. 
and and you feel like you understand it and don't understand it at the same time. But there's something almost magical about that, and something that that's that's intense about that, which is really satisfying. Um, so so that's what I would say is is dive in uh, and and keep swimming, and and it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm really proud of us, Brian. We managed to talk for about 45 minutes about this book without revealing some of the surprises that are in store. Right. Um, and yeah. so, for hey, so first of all, kudos to us. Yes. And second of all, uh, for those who you know wish that we had gotten into more detail with that stuff, sorry. Uh, but if you've never read the book before, go check it out, pick it up. Like I said, I'm I'm done with the first of the three novellas. It's the longest one. Um, and uh, I'm definitely continuing because mm-hmm. I want to see what you're talking about yeah, with yeah. The, the introduction of more right. and more um, discord and unreliability. Right. Um, anyway, so I hope people will go check it out. And if you're watching on YouTube, by the way, uh, I'm holding up the copy that you should be looking for because this is the, the Tor Essentials one with the intro by Brian Evanson. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're not, then... If you're listening on the podcast, I'll link to it in the description so you can go check that out. Um, but Brian Evanson, thank you so much for introducing us to this book. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Good. I'm, I'm glad you could join us. And for those of you listening, again, I will link to Brian's stuff in the show notes or in the description on YouTube. Um, but I'll also link to our stuff. Go to thelegendarium.com where you can find uh, all, all of our Oh, gosh, what are we? We're closing in on 450 episodes or something like that. Uh, all of those episodes are grouped on the website by author uh, mm-hmm. or by subject. And so if you're, you know, because we bounce around a lot. So if you want to see all of our stuff on, well, pretty soon we'll do a lot more Gene Wolf stuff. So Gene Wolf mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever other authors we've covered, uh, we group them all there. You can also find a link to join our Discord server and uh, speak with, gosh, Uh, what 1500 other sci-fi fantasy nerds who are all eager to talk about your favorite book so go check that out and lastly there is a link to patreon if you enjoy what we do we much appreciate those who uh, throw a buck in the tip jar uh, every episode over on patreon so i think that'll do it until our next episode so brian once again thanks for coming on thank you and i will see everybody next time